Thank you. It's been a, it's been a long day, but I th hope a very productive one. And uh, I must confess that the uh, various presenters uh, talking about their life stories or whatever have d did such a good job that I feel very intimidated. And I think I need to take lessons on how to uh, do a better job of presenting. <laughs> No, I, I, I just think they did, I'm joking, of course. I, but it's just a great, great job, and I was very, very impressed. Actually, let's give another round of applause. Then. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm under strict orders not to run over 30 minutes, and I'm going to try to do, well, I've, you're promised to talk about visualization, but I thought I'd do a little bit about dyslexic entrepreneurs, just because I haven't had a chance to put that in. So. Let, let me go right in if you're in the, so we have dyslexic entrepreneurs and CEOs. And I just wanted to talk about this. This is a, a major magazine in <clears throat> United States called Fortune, and it's really directed to the heads of various companies, chief executive officers. And this is a treasured uh, cover for me. It said, uh, Craig McCall's cosmic ambition, the dyslexic visionary on the front cover, this was years ago, who fathered cellular, wants to launch an even big, bigger industry. But just the very fact that the business, a, a main business publication used that term dyslexic visionary years ago was really, I thought, a, a bit of a turning point. So that's, but it is, so this is not a new idea, <laughs> but it's, it, it's actually, it's, logical that the business people would pick up on it earlier because we're talking about performance here, not credentials, <laughs> which is different sometimes. And then the, the, they followed this up later with a, a different um, <clears throat> cover. It said the dyslexic CEO, Charles Schwab, Richard Branson, all these names are familiar to you, Craig McCall, John Chambers of Cisco, triumphed over America's number one learning disorder, your kid can too. That's, that's addressed to a business audience. So then there you have some of the people um, depicted here. Then th there's, there's another dyslexic CEO who is named Barbara Corcoran. She's not famous. I was about to show you a little bit of a a DVD about Richard Branson because we appeared together on the same British program years ago. But then I thought, oh no, Barbara would be better because nobody knows who she is, but she's a woman <laughs> CEO, and we don't really get enough about that. And she's really very, very good. Um, so, but, uh, but then I will talk, so just talk about Richard Branson. He, with, with his book that he went, went to, you saw him on various things, but it's with this book that he first went public with his dyslexia. And uh, in fact, we came here on Richard's airplane, <laughs> part of the way anyway. And then one day, I, I was go at Oxford in England, and I, I, the train pulled in, and I said, my goodness, it's his train. <laughs> and then I, then I read this article about his rocket ships. Well, unfortunately, of course, many of you probably know that one of them blew up recently. But he's going to carry on, and every then he's going to make good on all those tickets. Anybody who wants to go into space can go with Richard. So, before I jump on, I'm just I want to go to Barbara Corcoran and let her speak for herself as a dyslexic chief executive officer. And uh, let's see if I can figure out how to make this happen. Very good school, really good with financial statements. She was a container, knew how to put everything in a tiny little box. And against her, I learned how to fly. I'm the expander. And so I found that in business, the early fear I had that, oh my God, how will I do these rudimentary tasks when I couldn't do them at school, was much worry about nothing. Because all I had to do was find an opposite. And so in my entire business, every single department, I learned early on to put an expander and a container and lock them together at the hip. And that was a powerful department that would fly together because naturally people attract opposites and opposites really work at work. A gift that I have clearly is I know people 
And business has nothing to do with dollars and cents. I still can't read a financial statement. Who cares? I never did that. I found someone who knows how to do it. But what I am great at is picking the right people, seeing the gift in other people, what they'd be good at, who wouldn't be good at what, and moving people around the way most people would move around furniture. Once you've walked in the shoes of someone who's struggling, like dyslexic kids do in school, you get another gift that you don't even know about, which is you know how it feels to feel like a loser. And so for me, I was always able in the workplace to spot a loser a mile away, someone who was insecure, someone who was struggling, someone who needed to have their job changed. I could see them a mile away, reach out to them, really understand what they were feeling and make a change. And do you know what that built for me over all these years? It built for me enormous loyalty. Because when you can understand how people struggle, and that's something you really don't get to understand unless you've done it yourself. And so I was able to build a family of people, huge, that felt like they were in a small family and felt close to me because they knew I got them. And it really is easy to run and get the cup. <laughs> the hard part is losing. And so what I think has been so helpful to me is I spent all of my early years losing. And so my God, how sweet the winning feels and how easy it is to win. But a lot of people who have everything come easily, particularly the A's and the B's in school, they don't know really what it feels like to lose. And so it's pretty shocking when you get thrown out into the real world. For me, the more hits I took and the more failures I had, the more I felt at home. I think a dyslexic personality is perfect for business. And yet, this very is my often favorite people part. Think dyslexic personalities can't be the engineer or the attorney or the doctor. Well, any kind of a course that takes a lot of book study, yeah, perhaps they're right. But if it doesn't take that kind of study, if you could get using your mouth, your feet right from the beginning, my God, you're going to do well in business. You've got to leg up. When I was in school, I couldn't even know what my assignments were. I was so confused all the time. So wouldn't you think that I would be apt to grow up being totally disorganized? But yet, in business, I'm the most organized person you would ever want to meet. Everything has a place. Every system works like a great Swiss clock. And the reason for that is when I got into the business world, I realized that I had to plan so carefully to make sure that I would never be embarrassed again. I don't ever want to be in a situation where I don't have the materials that I need because it just is a little too close to my bone of being in that classroom all over again and reading out loud and people thinking I was stupid. I am never stupid now in front of anybody because I'm such a good planner. So a great gift, I think, of being dyslexia is you overcompensate by making sure your ducks are in order. And my God, what a gift that is in business. My mother told me I had a great imagination and that with it, I learned to fill in all the blanks. That's what she said. Little did I know, she was dictating that in business, I would be great with baloney. Baloney meaning just great at like talking my way into or out of anything. So when I don't have the answers, I can come up with the most creative words and solutions that no one even knows I don't have the answers. I make it sound so good. And the reason for that is you do build the muscle that you don't have in school. And the muscle I didn't have in school is the ability to decode, to read, to write. And so what do you think I was doing right after 3 o'clock every day until I went to bed? I was using a new muscle called my mouth. And boy, did I learn how to throw the baloney around with the kids. And I've been doing it ever since. And boy, is that an important gift in business. It's more important than knowledge. I was always surprised when I was put into a room with a bunch of Harvard MBAs, well-educated attorneys, all the A students that would be working on some conceptual problem, some new direction, somewhere we wanted to take the business or the industry. And there were lots of ideas in the room, but I t to be honest with you, there were a lot of little ideas in the room. I had the ability to sit there like a sponge, kind of almost zone out on it, kind of get the little pieces and come up with the big idea each and every time. And more important than that, I could see how each person in the room was going to fit in a specific role of making it happen. And when I would say, whoa, whoa, whoa I got it, people learned to listen to me because I always got it. And most importantly, I could just paint that big, bright picture and everyone could see it. And nothing's better than giving a bunch of people running in different directions a road map that they all saw in living color and it would motivate them and get them all running off the page in the same direction. So visualization 
and ability to communicate are really the only two things you need to get a bunch of disparate parts and make them a team. And if there's one thing dyslexic people can very often do is make a bunch of people go left, right, or in between a big team buying into one big picture, but you've got to be able to convey that picture. Um, so, did you all, it, it, was it all clear to hear that and understand what she's saying? that all these Harvard MBAs and lawyers and so forth are standing in, around the room, sitting around, dealing with some new initiative, and, and they had all these little ideas, but they didn't integrate them. But she was just quiet, and listening, and then putting it all together, and say, I know how we can do this, and you do this, and the other guy does that, and what is, what's a business, what's an entrepreneur supposed to do? I mean, it, anybody who's doing a creative organization needs those kinds of skills. And, this, and Barbara, is, it's just, actually, I love that passage so much, I put it in the, in the epilogue of my, the new version of my old book, because I think it, it's just, she says just the right things, visualization, organization, sort of putting all the different pieces together. Well, let me jump now into another part where we're going to talk about um, another kind of visualization. The power of visualization and working at set various levels. Um, the kind of visualization that Leonardo da Vinci did as, with his dyslexia. Someone said, how come you didn't mention Leonardo da Vinci? And I said, well, I, really haven't gotten to that section yet. <laughs> and uh, and uh, apparently the, um, the PowerPoint is not coming up, so I'm just going to skip over that for the time being. And what I really want to do is get into a visualization. We were talking before about DNA and the shape of DNA and using um, X-ray crystallography. And I want to show you something was done <clears throat> with the copying of this is the visualization of some fundamental in you know, an animation, computer animation, of the fundamental copying process that every cell goes through. And uh, I think this was made at the anniversary of the, the discovery of uh, the, the structure of DNA. But I, I recall that a friend of mine who's a molecular biologist realized that she, there's a whole fundamental part of what was going on that she did not understand until she saw this visualization. So let me put that on right now. It's, uh, there's, a, there's a soundtrack that explains it, but it shows that, first of all, how the DNA coils up like a coil of rope, and then also how it copies itself at extreme speed, the, the same speed as a jet engine, they say, which is just um, every time one of your cells splits, this goes on. It's just quite amazing. Um, so. This is three minutes long. And we have sound. Great. In this animation, we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is tightly packed up so that six feet of this long molecule fits into the microscopic nucleus of every cell. The process starts when DNA is wrapped around special protein molecules called histones. The combined loop of DNA and protein is called a nucleosome. Next, the nucleosomes are packaged into a thread. The end result is a fiber known as chromatin. This fiber is then looped and coiled yet again. leading finally to the familiar shapes known as chromosomes, which can be seen in the nucleus of dividing cells. Chromosomes are not always present. They form around the time cells divide when the two copies of the cell's DNA need to be separated.
Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of amazing miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. Well, this is, this is my way of showing you what the world of dyslexics is like and what the, there are so many dyslexics who are involved in this business, but this is a way that I, ha, I want to say is the way their brain works. They're thinking in pictures, they're seeing these things. It's quite different than, than texts and numbers. But uh, uh, I think this is what all of us will see more and more. And it's really a, a kind of a, a, a revolution for certain. Um, I, I think I will, I will finish off with, we talked about the, 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 uh, the very small things in the DNA, and I want to show you a, uh, a very large thing to finish off with here. To give you the, the full range of scale This is the whole, we had talked about DNA, this very small thing, and now here is the, the whole universe through big blocks of time. Um, and, and how you can use visualization to really show this, this thing called the cosmic clock. We on Earth see the night sky as a single image filled with points of light. Yet, each ray of light that reaches our eyes at this moment has a different history. The story that is told by these lights is like a fantastic time machine that reveals snapshots of the cosmos reaching back towards the beginning of time itself. The astronomical objects that we can see lie inside a solid cone of space that we can extract and set aside as a visible timeline. We can emphasize the different eras of this visual cosmic clock by assigning symbolic colors to the light from each time zone so that nearby recent objects show in white with more distant objects evolving through blue and yellow to red for light that is very old and comes from more distant places. At the top are the most ancient objects spread out across the entire visible cosmos. The velocity of light is finite, so we can only see as far back as light has had time to travel on its journey to Earth since the universe began. As we finish roaming around the sky, we can see both the positions and the ages of our astronomical objects using the colors in the main image and the time-calibrated cone on the side. Another way to see how our cosmic clock ticks is to stand outside and watch a spherical shell expanding at the speed of light as older and older objects are encountered and enter the region of visibility inside the shell. We adjust the conical volume that is our cosmic clock so that any slice contains a condensed map of the entire spherical shell of the universe at that time. 
When we turn the Milky Way on its edge and pull our viewpoint back through the mass of observable galaxies, we see the disk-shaped gap where the Milky Way itself shadows our view of distant galaxies. When we finally reach back to the cosmic background radiation, the earliest visible light in the universe, we reverse our direction and return quickly through the whole series of scales to the Earth. So far, we have imagined the universe to be held constant at its current size. The ancient universe was in fact much smaller than it is today, reaching a size about one one thousandth of its present size at the moment the three degree cosmic background radiation was set free to reach our instruments. Finally, we retrace our journey forward in time from this great flash as the universe literally expands under our feet. The final tick of the cosmic clock occurs when we once again return home to our own Earth in our own place and in our own time. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get the soundtrack on that, but I wanted you to see it. It's really, we've been traveling through the whole universe at the speed of light, <laughs> and this is real data, and this is real information, and this is the sort of the upper echelon of how a visualization can help us to understand our, our world, the tiny things of DNA and the, the big situ uh, traveling through our, the Milky Way, our galaxy, and many other galaxies at different times. So what they were really trying to show you, that, that um, how the universe looks now, how the star systems looks now, but also how it looked long ago at the beginning of the, just after the Big Bang. Um, but at this point, I've been asked to make sure that we don't have a very long period, and I, I'm, I would like to know any any sort of questions and comments people might have about visualization or CEOs or some of the things they talked about this morning, um, especially the, uh, the, the, the uh, fractals in your <laughs> cell phone or uh, the visualization uh, in mathematics from Mandelbrot or, or biologists doing paleontology and finding uh, uh, flexible blood vessels in, uh, in 65 million year old uh, fossils. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot about, and the, the role of dyslexics in every one of these pieces is major. So uh, Thomas, you have, look like you have ready for a question there or comment. <laughs> well, see, that's a, this is a paradox. The, some of the best writers, and many writers, are, are dyslexic. And uh, uh, actually, I was asked to write something about this. And uh, my answer is that, uh, that uh, writing is, is really an oral communication that has to do with, doesn't have anything much to do with spelling at all. It has to do with frequently imagination sound of language, choosing simple language rather than unnecessarily obscure terminology. Uh, actually, sound of language is really important. Um, people like Churchill really loved the sound of language. And this poet, William Butler Yeats, was, was uh, he said he started with the sound or a rhythm, and then the, the uh, you're, you're nodding, <laughs> Uh, in, in agreement, and then um, he would then the sense of this would would come, and then the use of visual images in their mind, which they communicate to, to you in your mind, but it's still through the medium of words. So this is what I think some of the things that that help us to understand what is the relationship between a writing and people who are dyslexic. It's. You're quite right, it doesn't seem to fit, but it does. <laughs> so I'm just curious to see, like, I mean, without um, overstating the point, it does seem that 
there's no limit to someone with dyslexia. They can be successful authors, successful CEO, successful scientists. That's, that's the point. <laughs> And of course, we want to know, how did this happen? That's why I go back to this, my first couple of slides, was that, that, uh, that if we try to systematically understand the, the successful dyslexics, how they got there, what kinds, of, what kinds of dyslexics they are, if you like, but then we can more easily identify these things in the kids and help them to find their areas of special strengths and, uh, and uh, help them along the way. I mean, it's, it's powerful stuff. Sorry, just one last question. Sure. I see this list of names and I'm just curious, have you ever tried to see if any of these people were dyslexic? Well, these particular ones, no, but this is frequently what I've done because I attend this computer graphics conference regularly. And, uh, and frequently I have met the people, I, I find a thing that I think is particularly interesting and I introduce myself to the people who are involved. And uh, I think maybe half of the people I contact are really dyslexic. And um, that's not a scientific sample, <laughs> of course. But, uh, but it is clear that, that it, it's not unusual at all. The certain occupational groups are, have many, many dyslexics. And, and it's really the other puzzling thing is how did they arrive at this high level of proficiency <laughs> at a, in a professional way, whether it's in medicine or astronomy or, or other things. And there's always a very interesting story about how they came in through the back door <laughs> and something happened so that they, were, they got sort of on the job training or whatever. The usual barriers against their participation got, they went around them one way or another. So it's, uh, it is fascinating, but it in fact is, is important. And we shouldn't, they shouldn't be things where people are always going in through the back door. If we had the, the right combination, we could, they could go through the front door. So anybody else, Pre questions or comments?